65 due to the accident might have delayed. Some people I know have made it difficult for me to get here. Uh, my name is Cecilia Pareto, and I'm from the College of Education and Human Development, and I'm with the Office of Research. Um, although I hear our name is going to be changing soon, that's who I am right now. <laughs> um, not my name, but the offices. Um, and uh, we had a couple changes on our agenda today. Dr. Sun, Jeffrey Sun, was supposed to be here to actually um, introduce uh, everyone and to welcome you all here. Um, he is not feeling well today, so I am taking his place. Um, and we'll have another change, which I'll mention in a minute. But we, the College of Education and Human Development, um, we are so pleased to present to you this opportunity um, to have Jefferson County Public Schools and OVAC, the um, Ohio Valley Educational Cooperative, to support, to talk about how you can, how they can work together to support your research uh, initiatives. Um, it's collaborations like this that make you a great place to invest. I think you've probably heard that phrase before. Um, but like the newly released 2019-2020 uh, strategic plan, this program's goal is to improve the ease of impact of partnering with the university by building and stewarding mutually beneficial relationships that support student success, faculty productivity, and staff development. So I want to thank JCPS and um, OVEC for agreeing to speak with us today so we can ease the process of partnering on grant proposals and making our collaborative research more successful. Um, after our speakers share their wisdom, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion from some U of L faculty who have successfully collaborated with JCPS or OVEC um, so they can share like, some of their secrets to success in collaboration. Um, and then we're going to open up afterwards for questions and answers to the panel and our speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, the first person's name you see on the list here is Becky Crump, and unfortunately, Becky was unable to be with us today, but she um, sent in her place a very capable uh, person on her staff, um, and her name is Julianne Morris. Um, she is a grant developer at the resource development um, with Jefferson County Public Schools. She has more than eight years of experience as a full-time grant professional. She's worked for uh, Bullitt County Public County Schools as the district's first ever district grant writer uh, before joining Jefferson County Public Schools uh, in 2015. In this role, she leads the development of federal, state, and foundation grant applications conducts grant writing workshops and district and community uh, groups, and like me, we're both compression plan trained, uh, as is Stephen uh, Lynn. Um, are, and you are too, aren't you? I forgot about that. And Dr. Leslie Taylor, um, which you might be hearing more about because it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, Dr. Leslie Taylor is going to be here talking about, um, she's the research and evaluation specialist with Jefferson County Public Schools, and she has been conducting research in cognition, cognition and education for over 20 years. Currently, she uh, coordinates institutional research at, or JCPS, chairs the JCPS IRB, and assists with evaluation, data statistical analysis, and recommendations for district and school initiatives to ensure alignment with JCPS priorities, as well as the state and federal regulations. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, previously, Dr. Taylor has a research was a research scientist for a human resource uh, research organization, which is H M R R O, uh, where she assisted multiple federal, state, and district education agencies with program evaluations, curriculum and instru uh, instruction evaluation and alignment studies on state uh, on-site school evaluations and approving state accountability systems. Dr. Taylor holds a PhD in experimental uh, psychology from the University of Louisville Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, we'd also like to welcome Dr. Stephen Lynn, uh, who has the title of Research and Evaluation Specialist at um, Jefferson County Public Schools, and he is the lead. He leads the program evaluation work for JCPS while conducting internal and grant-funded research. He also a member of the IRB committee 
His work aims to bring understanding and insight for decision making through an analytical lens. Dr. Lynn came to JCPS after working for Kentucky Youth Advocates as a policy director focusing on economic and health policy analysis uh, and legislation impact evaluations. He is also a practitioner for trade, having taught secondary mathematics as a classroom teacher at Ballard High School. Dr. Lynn holds a PhD in education and social change from Ballard University. So without further ado, welcome to all of you and Julian, you have the floor. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you all for having us today. We've got a few uh, emails here for you to get in touch with us, and there are copies of our um, PowerPoint presentation out front if you didn't see them on your way in. So that's how you can contact us. So let's start with a few facts about JCPS. Um, a lot of people don't realize that JCPS is the 29th largest school system in the U.S. 81% um, of all children in Jefferson County attend the, the district. We have 169 schools with 98,361 students. That's pre-K through 12. Um, we have a majority of our students are students of color, 57% 50, non-white students, 43% white. And we have 12,393 special education students. This one, I love this stat, 125 different languages spoken by our students. Um, it just kind of shows the diversity and 63% of our students are eligible for free or reduced price meals. It's just a brief overview. Uh, we have over 6,700 teachers in the district. 85% uh, of those have a master's degree, and um, JCPS has 432 of the state's more than 3,000 teachers with national board certification. <coughs> So our schools, we have um, 90 elementary schools, 26 middle schools, 22 high schools, 14 alternative schools, 17 state agency schools. Our department, I'm part of the Resource Development Department, like Cecilia said, and um, we have four full-time grant writers on staff. So we deal with, um, actually we're grant developers, that's our official title. But we also, we obviously work on grant applications. We also assist with letters of support um, that external agencies might need as part of their grant applications. We assist um, with developing and drafting partnership agreements in ways and reviews. We also, everyone on our staff now is um, a trained compression planning facilitator. So we, we provide a lot of compression planning services throughout the district and for community organizations as well. Um, so in the last three years, we've written on average 160 grants per year between the four of us. And um, IRB requests, we get more than 100 annually. And there's one staff and committee handling those requests. So a few tips on working with JCPS. Um, do your homework. We have a lot of resources available on the JCPS website. Um, to figure out if and how your project aligns with the mission, the vision, and the priorities of JCPS. So you might want to start with the strategic plan, and there are links to all of these documents. They're all publicly available. Um, but the strategic plan really sets the priorities for the district. And as part of our grant review process, we make sure that every single project that we are proposing ties back to the strategic plan. We list the number the focus area, the goal that it relates back to, just so that it's explicitly clear that this aligns with um, what we're doing as a district. We also have um, the Backpack of Success Skills. You might have heard about this initiative. Um, it's an online digital platform posted on Google Drive where students can upload um, artifacts of their learning. And so they, are, they upload artifacts around five different areas. Um, prepared and resilient learner, globally and culturally competent citizen, emerging innovator, effective communicator, and um, productive collaborator. So throughout their school years, they're uploading these artifacts that uh, prove that they are growing in these areas. And then at the major transition points in school, fifth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade, they give a defense, a verbal defense of their growth and their learning in these areas. 
Um, but it's, it's wise to read up on this because this is a huge initiative. Um, we're tying a lot of our work to backpack of success skills, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, also, we encourage you to read the Racial Education Equity Plan that the district recently adopted. Um, this is aimed at creating parity and accessibility to educational programs and resources and opportunities for all students. Um, that's really, we're viewing all of our work through a racial equity lens these days, so that's an important document. And you can also find a lot of information on our um, Board of Education website, on the district's website. Uh, you can review the Board of Education work sessions, minutes from the meetings, find out what the recent initiatives have been. So those are all great, great places to look just to start as you're thinking about your project and how it relates to what we're doing. So we have an internal process for resource development. Um, contact us regarding all grant applications, whether you're going to be the applicant, whether we're going to be the applicant, whatever you envision. Um, contact us before submitting or committing JCPS as a partner. Um, this is an important step, and we encourage you to, to contact us. You know, the second you find the grant thing, you might want to partner with us. The sooner, the better. Um, decisions about grants, whether we apply, whether we commit as a partner, are really made by a team that involves um, not just our department, but you know, assistant superintendents, principals, chiefs, um, sometimes the superintendent, if it's at a high enough level. Um, so keep that in mind that it's not one person making a decision whether or not to move forward with an application. And we have a form to request letters of support available on our website. Um, so this will really just give us an overview of what you're proposing, what JCPS will be committing in terms of any financial support, any in-kind support, um, what would the commitment look like from our teachers, from our principals, really helps kind of set the stage for what you're trying to do. So we ask that um, organizations fill this out if they need a letter of support for, a, for an application and then that will help us get the approval needed. Um, so we ask at least five days in advance um, to get those letter of support um, forms submitted. That will give us time. Uh, the superintendent is who signs letters of support. So we need time to send it through the process, so at least five days. But ideally, you will have been working with us from the, the minute that you realized you wanted to work with JCPS. So hopefully we'll have a longer lead time than a week, but a minimum of a week. Um, a few things to keep in mind. As a public school district, our laws, rules, policies, and procedures um, are different than for a post-secondary institution. For example, we have um, state statutes on background check requirements and um, child and abuse and neglect verification that we have to follow that might look different for us than for you. Um, so just just things to keep in mind that it might not look identical, so the sooner we can communicate about what those differences might be, the better. Um, schools are not legal entities, so when we sign on as an applicant, it's the district signing on. Our tax ID number is uh, for the Board of Education, not for our single school. We require board approval on all contracts, MOUs, MOAs, partnership agreements, um, anything like that. The board has to go through our formal board process and have their sign off before the superintendent can sign. Um, they meet once a month for to conduct business. So we uh, like to tell you all that it takes about six to eight weeks to get an agreement on a board agenda. So we need quite a bit of lead time. Um, that involves that includes, um, the six to eight weeks includes review by the um, assistant superintendent in chief uh, whose area your project impacts as well as our general counsel. Have a lot of people looking at that to make sure it's good to go. So here are some key dates to keep in mind. Um, the budget process for schools uh, is typically completed by the end of February. So Again, if you have a project that's going to impact the coming, uh, the coming um, school year, they're already setting up their priorities, the way they're going to spend their money in, in February, or by the end of February. So the sooner you can approach us, the better. Um, PD plans are for the summer are determined by the end of March. So again, if your project involves a lot of teacher PD, the sooner we know, the better. <laughs> and the principals can tell you whether or not 
your PD plan would fit in with what they already have on tap. And then spring break and the testing window. Spring break is always the first week of April. Testing windows two weeks in mid-May. These are hard weeks to get in touch with anyone. <laughs> Principal, a lot of people are out of the building, out of town. Um, if you need signatures in those weeks, that can be very challenging. You might get lucky and the superintendent might be in, but he might also be gone. So just keep that in mind as you're planning out in your project completion um, calendar and just basically black those out and will be my advice and assume you don't have access to, um, to people during those weeks just in case. And a few challenges that we've seen over the years um, and that have come up as we work with external partners. So working in CSI schools, and CSI are comprehensive support and improvement schools, um, they, so CSI schools have more constraints um, because they have very specific turnaround plans that are approved by the state. It can be um, more challenging to partner with them just because of those constraints and their um, very strategic focus on turn, in the school turnaround work. It's not to say you can't do it, it's just be aware that they, those constraints are in place. Um, we have more than 20 CSI schools currently, although that number probably will change in the next couple weeks as state test scores are released. Um, professional development. So sometimes this can be a problem. Um, teachers are required to do 24 hours of professional development per year. Um, if you're proposing professional development, just keep in mind a lot of teachers complete their professional development early in the school year, and once they hit that um, maximum, or that, I'm sorry, the required limit, they're not required to do additional. So be thinking about that. If, if that's part of your project, think of incentives to get teachers to participate. Um, just keep in mind that because of the teacher contract and um, regulations on that, it can sometimes be challenging um, to incorporate a lot of PD as part of a program. It's not possible. It's just you have to think of ways to make it um, so great that they have to be there. <laughs> New curriculum, that's another area. Um, the principals and sometimes even SBDM have to sign off and approve on new curriculum. Keep that in mind as you're um, looking at projects. And um, a lot of times with new curriculum comes a requirement or a need for training and professional development. Short turnaround time, I've kind of touched on this a little, but we always say the second you find a grant and you think you might want to partner with JCPS, give us a call. Even if it's not set in stone, even if you're not positive, you're going to follow through on it. Give us a call so we can start thinking about ways we can partner and it will give us time to get the right people at the table and make sure that you, um, you have enough time to complete the process that we have to go through. Um, we get a lot of calls last minute like, I have this grant due in three days and we really want you to see this partner. And it's, it's just very challenging to create a high quality proposal that really benefits our students in that short of a time frame. So again, if, even if it doesn't end up working out, we'd rather you call us sooner than later. Um, it's always a challenge if JCPS is listed as a partner in a grant but not directly involved in the project planning. This happens more often than you probably think. Um, where people don't understand they need to discuss it with us before listing us um, as a partner. Anytime you want to work with our students, even if JCPS is not committing any money, any in-kind support, um, if you want to come into our schools and work with our students, we need to be involved in the planning process. <coughs> kind of goes back again to um, making sure that everything aligns with the district's vision and mission and uh, priorities and also that we're following all the rules and regulations that we need to. And uh, again, committee match, even in kind, that has to be, we have to discuss that ahead of time. And uh, ch another challenge is requests made during testing, during that testing period. That's just a challenging time for schools. They are so busy. <coughs> Principals are always busy, but during that time, it can be hard to get uh, enough time with them to, to discuss and really um, pull together a strong proposal. So. Just keep in mind that requests made during that time, it might be a bit more of a challenge. And that's all I have for you today. I'm going to let Stephen take over. Thank you, Julia. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Stephen Lynn. Thank you, Cecilia, for having us here. So, 
I am in the Accountability Research and Systems Improvement Office at JCPS, and also known as RC, which is a fabulous actor. So, okay. Um, I also recognize that we are here at the University of Louisville, and I'm showing you a slide that says University of Chicago. So, this is something that this is a model in which we really try to subscribe to when we talk about research in schools or a school district. They want to know if something is relevant. Is it going to sustain an impact? Are we going to have a partnership? It doesn't matter. So does it, is it relevant to our students and our staff? At the end of the day, we are here for our students. We are here to help them learn. We are here to help them achieve and to grow. So is it relevant for our students and the staff that is serving them every day in the classroom? Is it going to make an impact? Will we actually be able to help move the needle on a lot of our student work? Is it a partnership? This is interesting because it's sometimes we're going to help the, st help the school district, but it really is that are you doing something to us or for us and not with us? So how can we collaborate and do, and do and conduct research within our schools? It doesn't matter. What's relevant right now? What matters to our community? What matters to our students? What matters to their lives? And how can we move that forward? So. This is something that we kind of uh, really subscribe to and want to move forward. And I'm sure we'll, we don't partner with the University of Chicago, but we are here today with you all. So this is something that we could possibly look forward to in the future. So a lot of our work is regarding how do we access the information that the district has. JCPS has a lot of information on a lot of students, a lot of staff, and a lot of longitudinal information. So how do you get it? That's the big question, right? So we have a kind of a framework here. This is our approach. There's a lot of public information and data requests that come into our office. There are things available to you that you may not recognize or realize if you're new to the city or if you've been here for 30 years conducting research, we may have something on our website that you may not know is there. We also have non-public information and data requests come through our office. That comes through a lot of data management partners. That uh, sometimes requires data sharing agreements or other types of agreements that our office or resource development develops. We also do uh, program evaluations in our office for internal purposes. Sometimes we've done external ones for community partners or um, in collaboration with local universities. And we finally, we also do traditional research. Although, although not as much, uh, we do uh, Dr. Alyssa Taylor, and all of our team really does try to do some research from time to time. So, how can we access this information? The public information that is available on our website <coughs> can be a gold line for you. We'll get there, we'll get there. But there, are, there is a significant amount of information and if you can't find it, you can ask us, or you can submit an open records request. As a public institution, I'm sure you all are very aware of the Freedom of Information Act and how uh, information can be available. Much of what you need or what you want can, in fact, be found through our website. Now, I do apologize for our website. It is not that friendly. So, are they going to get this electronically? So, so you have our handouts. Uh, handouts really don't help with hyperlinks. So what we're going to try to do is we'll try to get you, if you need, uh, the links to all of these sources of information. We can uh, try to make that available to you. So just reach out or reach out to Cecilia and look at this team. So here are a few things that are available uh, for you to use, extract, and uh, use it basically for whatever purpose you may need. We have uh, what we call JCPS data books. Has anybody, has anybody accessed that before? Okay, okay. Jason, yes you have. So the JCPS data books, uh, in short, it is annual information that provides frame of lunch accounts by school, uh, enrollment counts by zip code, by race, by school. And all of a sudden you start seeing academic data not academic data, it's all at the school level, so it's uh, not identifiable. However, you have aggregate level information all throughout the data books. 
that is a valuable source in our office. Actually, my team, what we do is we collect this every year, and the new ones will be published late October. So for the last school year, you'll start seeing all this information. You'll have projected enrollments. You'll have actual enrollments. You'll have attends or resides. Resides, anybody know where resides means? Neighborhood school, kind of, but not really neighborhood school. Um, basically, there's probably 100 or so indicators that we capture in the data books that, that you're free to use for grant applications, for just traditional research, what have you. That is a fabulous resource. If you just go into JCPS, actually use Google, I think JCPS data books, it'll take you straight there. So we have it at the elementary, middle, and high school level. What is not in there is alternative school information. We protect our alternative school students um, at grade levels. There's school performance data also on our website. That's pretty much aggregate level K prep data. So looking at where we have been, where we currently are, obviously you're not getting the current test scores because it's uh, they're not publicly available yet. But once they are, they'll be here. You guys are seeing at the aggregate level information for school performance data that's submitted. School profiles. Let's say you want to do some grants or grant work or even a research project at a school. You can go find their school profile. That school profile has budget information. It has staff information. It has achievement information. It, has, it basically weighs out anything you really want to know about that um, on a surface level. Without going into a school, you can use that uh, as information that's freely available and it has to be posted on our website by um, uh, the statute. KDE, the school report card. We are just finishing that up, all the verification process and the cleaning of information. The school report card will be available in October, so just here in a few months, you can go on the KDE's website and access a, a number <coughs> of uh, academic data, behavior data, you can look at uh, demographic information. You can find things like how many Wi-Fi enabled devices are in a school. And so if you want to do a project about technology, you can go find a school that has maybe 50 Wi-Fi enabled devices. You won't because we have more than that. But we have, there are some uh, discrepancies in information. And you can see where there are gaps in resources based on the school report card. The National Student Clearinghouse is something that uh, a lot of universities are familiar with. The, this is a partnership uh, from post-secondary institutions and the school districts. What this is, is it's a massive database of students for the last, I believe, 15, 18 years. What it is, is when a student leaves the school district, you all track them, you follow them, you monitor them, you report that information back to the National Student Clearinghouse for our students, so that way it helps you and it helps us. So you can see where they've been, how they're doing, where are they going, and then we can say where, how successful are our students. Are they graduating with a bachelor's degree within seven years? It's, it's surprising how, how much we can use this information to uh, follow our students over some time. Are they completing an associate's degree? Are they going to college but not completing? Or, or are they going to the military? So that type of information, the matriculation information, is there for all of uh, universities in the region. So it's a, it's a valuable resource. It's on our website. And we had that report for, I like, believe, really the last five to 10 years. So it's on our website if you want to find that information. Tell Kentucky is a, um, a teacher voice or staff voice um, survey. And that is also there. It's a variety of uh, indicators from management to leadership to uh, the climate of what is happening within our schools. And you can see that all on our website. Of course, excuse me, you can go through the Tell Kentucky website. NCES also has a variety of data tools. I'm sure you all may be familiar with NCES. Um, I'm not going to go through that too much. but. One thing that's not on here is the Kentucky stats, KY stats. Did anybody go to the conference a week or two ago? Yes. KY stats is a um, it's an organization, it's a state agency that was created through legislation, and they are in Frankfurt as part of a collaborative effort to have a longitudinal data system for Kentucky. 
You can go to their website and request basically anything and everything you can think of. It is following students and where they are to post-secondary or not post-secondary. So where are they going uh, to work? Where is the labor market? You can find a variety of information through their website. It's kystats.ky.gov. Um, they are a valuable resource. They have all of our information and then some. They've partnered with KDE to basically obtain anything and everything on a student. You will not get identifiable information. So what you can do, which I learned very quickly, was, hey, if I want a data set or a match uh, group, they will create a match group with their students. They have every student in the entire state. So they are open. They are a good resource. If you can't, if we can't work together, or if we can't have, a, we don't have what you need, you can go to them and talk to them. So let's get back to what we do. So our team uh, employs seven researchers at the PhD or EDD level, and this is kind of what we do. You can read. I'm not going to really read that to you, but we do a lot of evaluations. We do. Uh, process, impact, outcome evaluations. We do internal resource studies, a lot of analysis and investigations on a variety of indicators. So in addition to all of our local universities, who we do partner with on a variety of projects, you can see here that we are also partner with other organizations across the country. And so uh, our team is much larger than seven people, but these are the seven individuals that um, really conduct the research within our institute. And with that, I'm sure we will have questions. And uh, I was brief, but we will have tailored questions and we will uh, answer this later. So I'm going to turn it over to Leslie, Dr. Leslie Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate you taking the time to understand more about us. And so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you about the JCPS Institutional Review Board and how you go about that process. <laughs> so I'm um, going to go back to the slide that Stephen put up earlier and explain a little, also kind of reiterate what he was explaining why we put this graphic together. One of the things that um, is sometimes unusual and perplexing to people who are external to JCPS it's not as um, perplexing to university people usually, but to a lot of our community partners, and we work with a lot of community partners, they uh, are not sure what or why, what, what is an IRB and why do I need to know about it? So um, the size of the, the circles, we were trying to kind of emphasize how much we deal with different types of inter information and data requests. And so traditional research is not something that we do proportionately as much as other kinds of requests that we get. Okay, so whether we're doing research internally or whether we're working with you all, we don't do as much. It's just not something that districts and state agencies spend that much time doing traditional research because of practical reasons uh, and constraints. So if you fall into any of the bluish bars, traditional research, program evaluation, either we're doing the evaluation or a lot of times with our community out of school time partners, they want data about students so they can evaluate their own programs, take it back to their boards, their funders. And a lot of the in non-public information and data requests also goes through IRB. It kind of depends on what you're asking for, but just know going in that you're probably going to have to start through the IRB process if, you're, um, if this is the kind of information you're looking for. So basically anything that we don't put out there publicly that's not on our website, uh, that we can't because of FERPA, then it has to go through IRB. Okay. So you probably know a little bit about this, but I'm always surprised, actually, when I talk to researchers, either from research, nonprofit research organizations or other institutions across the country, not really understanding the scope of an IRB, especially if you haven't had to do that many requests or go through that process yourself. It's honestly been over 20 years since I personally went through the UofL IRB, so it's been a while that I've um, not only doing this now, but also served on two different institutional IRBs over time. And so I had some time to think about this, but I know not everybody does if it's not a regular part of your process. So these are some of the federal reasons, because it's all about information sharing and making sure that the person you're getting that information from knows that, if, that, they're, that you're giving it away for a reason other than it was originally collected usually. So any existing information that JCPS has, academic data, behavior data, we collect that for our own purposes, for 
for learning, assessment, um, behavior evaluations, all of that is part of the normal course of daily education and operations. When you start going beyond that to answer a research question or do some kind of other evaluation, they need to know, parents and families need to know that they have the right to say no to those things. So it's not just about the methodology that you're using. We have people sometimes internally and externally say, oh, I'm doing a survey, so that counts as research. And I have other people say, I'm only doing a survey, that doesn't count as research. It's not about the method, it's about who are you and what are you trying to do with that information? Is it going outside of the organization? So again, when, when you come to us, our role, we know that you have an IRB, but every single institution that has an IRB, an authorized IRB is responsible. We don't currently have, and we're not planning on moving to having cooperative IRB, IRB agreements, and so under federal law, we can have agreements with other IRBs if we don't have one. Smaller school districts sometimes have those State education agencies sometimes have those if they don't simply have the capacity or resources. So our, our fundamental function is to protect our students, our families, and our staff. And that is the lens we will always go through to figure out um, whether or not we can allow something to happen. So we are required to look at, as are you, um, protection of human subjects and FERPA laws. And so they are not the same thing, but they both intertwine. So the informed consent process is always going to be the front end for our IRB and what conditions we stipulate for how we do information sharing. For any of you all who have gone through the data request management system at JCPS, it's kind of like an FTP site. So it is a secure server. That's the whole point of doing it. So when we ask you to do that, that is so we can often share information back and forth for you in a secure, a secure way. And we also need to make sure we have the right protections in place. And so that could mean different contracts, which we include as MOUs and MOAs and sometimes data sharing agreements. So all of that will, we will help funnel you through with the IRB process. Now, um, I'll say a couple of other things about that in just a minute. So um, we follow exactly the same federal guidelines, federal regulations. So um, if you've gone through your institutional IRB, you will be familiar with that. There could be some difference in interpretation sometimes, but remember, it's because we have to go through the lens of vulnerable populations. And so that is going to be the threshold that we always use to think about whether or not it can happen in our schools. We also have married the processes of looking at the federal requirements with, and balancing that with what JCPS needs. So, um, Julianne and Steven talked to you a little bit about make sure that what you have is something we need. JCPS policies and procedures are kind of changing right now. So there have been some changes in the past year and a half to two years in federal regulation, not a ton, but we're taking this opportunity district-wide to look at all of our processes and procedures. And um, so one of the things that we're doing is aligning each of these different internal processes. So it used to be the case, I wouldn't say they were entirely isolated, but IRB would meet, and then you would have contracts, and then data sharing, and open records requests. And we all kind of talked to each other, but we didn't have really strong written procedures to make sure that there were no conflicts. We are changing that so all of that gets considered at the same time. Now fortunately, we physically are located fairly close together, so I can run over and talk to Becky or Julianne and say, hey, I've got this, uh, or she can ask me, should this go through RB if they get a request from somebody externally? And we'll talk about it on the front end. But it is really important, as they were saying, for you to think about, do you have a sponsor for your project? Um, I know that Terry Scott and Andy Fryer are gonna talk a little bit later, and they definitely would have sponsors at the chief level to say, yes, this research is valuable, and that person is going to know internally whether or not it aligns with the current priorities. That's what we're looking for, and that is going to be a new requirement because we get a good 15 to 20 IRB requests every single week of all different scopes from all across the country. And so part of that reason, you may, it may or may not be a surprise to you, but remember, we're a large urban school district with a lot of information, so we get hit up a lot by other universities. I just got in a request last week from NCES, and they have an IES grant working with um, uh, University of Delaware, maybe. 
they're partnering to look at um, national education technology practices. So they're doing this throughout the country. It is a huge request because they want to go into all of our schools, mostly talk with staff, but they also want to interview students. And so we haven't even decided whether or not we're going to do this yet. And that's an important point. We don't have to do research. We don't have to let people in. And that's not to, we respect and appreciate the research that you do, but we have to balance all the different requests that we get. One little survey here and there that takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes of a staff member's time, it all adds up with all of the additional requirements that, frankly, we put on them as the district. And then they have state level and federal level requirements in order to make their daily, daily uh, schools function. So it's a lot. It adds up very quickly, and we have to try to balance and manage. So it really isn't that we don't agree with or respect the kind of research you have. So if we say no, please understand that it's not a personal issue. It is because we can't simply balance everything that we get in. So here's some things to consider as you think about putting in a research request. We are, I mentioned that we have new rules and procedures. Those are not on our website yet, but they should be within the next few weeks. I'm working with our webmaster of the district to push out new content. So please bear with us a little bit. I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with some people from U of L, with a lot of our external partners in the community and just saying, hey, here's where we're going. We are having this kind of a meeting in a few weeks for what we call the community um, cultural consortium, so Metro United Way, Metro Government, uh, REACH, I'm trying to think of some of the other, Americana, some of the smaller groups. So all of our, about 100 different community partners are going to come to hear about how they're going to work with us because if they're doing evaluation, then we're going to roll them all into this process to make sure that we can more easily track and streamline these things. So the three criteria that we will be looking for is do you comply with human subjects research, first and foremost? Is what you're doing violating any kind of JCPS policy that we have in place? So for example, I'll give you a very particular one. JCPS has a technology policy for students that they aren't allowed to use phones or any type of video equipment during the day. Specific kind of schools, Stephen mentioned alternative schools, is very strict. So if you're coming in and wanting to do video or have them do something that's going to require texting, we probably won't be able to do it. Because, and the reason why the district has that policy is because there's a state statute around it. So we've had to develop um, our own procedures. Uh, and then the thing that I just mentioned, sponsorship by a JCPS chief. So if you have some kind of questions, programs, interventions, or technologies that require evaluation, then that has to go with the board goals the chief's strategies for implementing, and they've got to sign off on that. And so we are happy to help you, me being my office and um, resource development office, in finding the right person if you don't have a relationship. But that has to happen before we will agree to do it. So what kinds of things are we interested in? This is very, very broad, I realize. We are not even talking about particular content areas. But the one thing I wanted to put up here it links back to something Stephen said is about the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA. If you're not familiar with that, please know that that is something that every single district and state agency is required to follow. It was reauthorized last year from the initial one back in the 1960s. This is what replaced NCLB. And the biggest change between the previous um, the previous act and the current one is this threshold that every school is required to have evidence-based practices that they implement. And so one of the things that schools and sometimes researchers say, well, what's the difference between a research-based practice and an evidence-based practice? And I think that their big difference is, or my explanation is it's, it's beyond hypothesis testing. You are not on the front end testing out. You better have solid evidence that this has worked in other school districts down to the same size the same demographic population, you have evidence that it has worked. So ESSA has four tiers of the type of level of research uh, and evidence that is acceptable. And for any schools that are considered comprehensive um, improvement schools or comprehensive school improvement, that is a federal designation and they are required. You can't, they can't do anything that doesn't fall into that category. So if you can help us with that, 
and you have some programs that, that you know about that you'd like to help implement in our schools, that would be great. If you have anything that would help us with any state or KDE requirements, because we are a lot of really under a lot of scrutiny, again, partly as a large school district. And um, I think that the other things would be more at local level for us, which is we have a huge diverse population, lots of at-risk students, 63% free and reduced lunch. That is way over the uh, national average. So those are things that we pay a lot of attention to. I'll just say a couple of things on the right. Um, it's not that we won't ever do random assignment of schools, but it is very challenging. And partly because unless we have the superintendent or um, the assistant superintendents who are over those schools agree for, say, our CSI and TSI schools, they aren't even accessible. So they have so many extra requirements that unless we have agreements from those people, then that, that's a top-down requirement that we, we, don't, we don't allow people to go in. Um, and we have found things where another reason why it's important to go through IRB, it, it helps us as a district, is we might have requirements or expectations in place for our school as a district, that happens to be in conflict with something that you might be doing as a program. So the district just implemented a reading program at many of our schools, and there was a particular project coming in, not through the bell, I don't think. Um, and it turned out that for the schools that they wanted to go into, it was gonna directly conflict with the requirements that they were gonna have in order to implement this particular reading program. So we had to say no, because we had already agreed to, and we're on board setting up the reading program internally. So that's something to think about, is if you have any of those kinds of um, elements to your programming, your research, then we're probably not going to be able to work that out. But we do want to partner with you if there are things that will, will be mutually beneficial to us. Do you have any questions right now, especially for those of you who may have been around for a while and this is a little bit new to your experience with the JCPS IRP process? Okay. So let me just say a few things about how to submit an application. This is the part that isn't out there yet, but I will make sure to get to you. You can even call me or email me, you know, probably the easiest to email me so I can attach a document back to you. We've got a draft manual, it's getting ready to roll out, but it will explain to you the procedures for how to get through the IRB. The, all of our applications are online. So you go into the data request management system and um, there's, there are a couple of links to get to the IRB section. So we don't do any paper applications and all of your materials get to be uploaded in this one place. And we've decided that that's a really easy way for us to track for federal purposes, all of the documentation, and, and then we can communicate internally with the IRB. So that's where we start. And we almost every single, if you're going through IRB, then very likely you're gonna need an informed consent form. That's probably why you're going through the IRB. So just know that. I know that most of you probably have your, um, your informed consent form from UofL. That's probably something that uh, we will, in the near future, may want to review with the UofL IRB because we've noticed that there are consistently a few pieces that don't really align with JCPS policy. And we're aware, though, that if we ask you, as a researcher, to come back, you've got to go through that process again, even if they can expedite it and make little changes, it's a change, it's a modification to an IRB. So uh, we're, we're thinking about and how to work on that so that they both work well together and we don't create extra issues for you. For the, this may not apply to as much to you all as it would to our community partners, but in case it does, some of you may or may not be used to using what we call a community partner form. And we also have something called the JCPS video release form. So instead of having all these separate types of consents, we're just going to have the informed consent. Really, the release form, the videotape release, is just for our schools to use. They collect these at the beginning of the year from families so that when they have good stories or information they want to share with the media. And so it's not really for external purposes, and we're definitely using it for that now. A community partner form is kind of broader, a little more vague. So we're, um, it won't apply. All right, so if you have any questions, you're happy to email me. And it's not that I don't want to talk to you, but I would think, uh, email's probably the best way as a starting point, and then I can schedule a time to talk with you about it. Because sometimes I can just send you 
uh, procedures or information back faster than you're going to be able to get to me at my desk. And there are also uh, other people who can respond as well. Under construction, just meaning that, as, as I mentioned a couple of times, we're not quite there yet, but we're going to put it out there. So please hold tight. Feel free to contact and ask us for information. And um, I think that's a couple of other things we'll tell you about our process. So think about these things as you're planning to submit. Um, the other thing that one of you all mentioned that during K prep season, we don't, that's a challenging time. But the district policy is we don't allow people to come in for the first six weeks of school or during the testing window. That makes it very difficult. There's only a short time that you're allowed to come in. And um, I've mentioned most of these things here. But the one thing that I did mention, number five, is that our IRB, because we get in so many requests and it's very challenging, we have district staff, community partners, since that's a requirement of the federal guidelines. We are shifting to a four time per year cycle. So we're going to a quarterly basis for our full reviews. We have been doing them monthly and then every other month and it was it still inundated a lot of our staff. So we're going to four times a year. We rarely exempt people from federal regulation. We sometimes will do expedited review and we can let you know that once you put your application in. Uh, but most, just know that that's what you need to gear towards if you're going to put an application in. That it's just been so challenging for us to manage this process that we've decided to. We, and we've also looked at what a lot of other large districts do. Some districts only have gone down to one time per year. Some do two. Some of them have started charging a $250 fee to even be part of the system. We don't want to go to that right now. So we're hoping we're going to try this out this year and see if this will help us to manage. Because the number of IRB requests have gone up substantially in the past couple of years. We averaged about 100 a year for the past each of the past few years. I think that's it. Thank you all. So thank you to all our speakers. Thank you so much. We have another section to our uh, presentation here, but before that, I want to go ahead and give you all a gift for you. Spending your time coming over here, presenting, navigating through our parking. <laughs> okay, so um, they mentioned in here uh, earlier that um, the, these will be available. Um, I'm going to, well, we're going to transition into a panel discussion right now. And while we're doing that, um, Steve, if you can hand out the evaluations that are, I said on the floor there, we have some evaluations um, in. There are only four short questions, and the fourth question on there is, do you want these digitally? So you can get to the hot link, so fill out the evaluation on there if you do want that, and I'll need your email address. Um, and so we're hoping to do more things like this if it's useful, so please uh, fill out the evaluation so we're able to continue doing that. Um, right now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, which is Jason Haskins. He is from uh, he's the Director of Development from the Ohio Valley Educational Cooperative. Um, in over 10 years of grant writing and fundraising, Jason Atkins has helped organize bring in more than $43 million in federal, state, and foundation and charitable funding. He is the Director of Development at the Ohio Valley Educational Cooperative, where he leads grant writing and fundraising efforts. Jason formerly worked at the Jefferson County Public Schools. Um, and has also provided consulting services to several local uh, nonprofits. He serves as a grant reviewer for federal, state, and foundation grant makers. In 2017, Jason earned his grant professional certification credential, and uh, he trains uh, others on grant writing through the Center of Nonprofit Excellence and uh, the Grant Professional Association. So. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, just a second, I'm going to get a PowerPoint pull up here. I have the world's smallest USB cord here, so I'm glad I didn't lose it. Jason was a little bit, <coughs> a little bit behind because he got caught in that traffic. So. Raise your hand if you need a pencil and I'll 
All right, yeah, thank you so much for letting me be here this morning to tell you about OVEC. Um, I'll explain who we are, some of the things we do. I also just want to second everything that uh, Jason Gibbs folks said. I worked there for about three years uh, as a grant writer, grant developer, and resource developer right, along, right alongside Julianne. Uh, and I just want to say um, that those timelines they presented are critical. When I worked there, when folks were on, on the ball with the timeline, getting us information, we had a lot more success. And I also know other school districts across the country call JCPS to figure out their process. So they're doing it really well, and I learned a lot while I was there. Um, so yeah, I want to tell you a little bit of, uh, about OVEC. Um, so anytime I have a meeting, I have to tell people who we are, what we do. It's just kind of a different type of organization. We're not a school district. Uh, we are an education support agency, and most states have a network of education support agencies, and they call them different things. In Kentucky, they're called educational cooperatives. Um, there are eight of them. They were established in the 70s by state law, and they started off doing services like bidding for small school districts to help them kind of manage some fiscal resources. But over the years, they've added some services as districts have expressed needs. Um, OVEC is located in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Uh, actually, though, uh, for about 10 years we were here at U of L, so it's a, it's a homecoming for me. Um, we're one of eight co-ops in the state, uh, and I'll show you our region in just a second. Uh, our governance structure, we have a board of directors, and that board includes the superintendents of the school districts that are our member districts. Um, so they call the shots and they represent what their districts need. Um, we have a nonprofit division as well, the Ohio Valley Educational Foundation. If you would like to make a major gift in the future, <laughs> I'll be hanging around afterward if you want to chat about that. Uh, there's our lovely logos there. All right, so our region. Uh, we serve a 12-county region, including Jefferson County and surrounding counties, and then going up the river toward northern Kentucky. Uh, those 12 counties have 15 school districts. If you're new to Kentucky education, uh, there are some independent school districts in the state. In our region, there's Anchorage Independent here in Jefferson County, there's Eminence Independent in Henry County, and then there's Frankfort Independent in Franklin County. Um, so those are the school districts that are member districts. Um, JCPS uh, joined last summer, and we're very glad to have them as part of our co-op. They bring a lot to the table and happy to serve them. Uh, like I said, we have 15 school districts. I want to give you a little bit just kind of like of the demographics, the facts and figures about our region. Um, our school locale codes, we can use this data. This is from NCPS, which Stephen mentioned during his presentation. Uh, but school locale codes tell you whether a school or a district, whether they're kind of urban or rural. Uh, we have one urban district, which you can guess is JCPS, is classified as a large city district. Um, at least a few years ago, there was one rural school in JCPS. Do you guys know this? Ramsey Middle had a rural school outcome code, locale code. I don't know if that's still the case, but um, so yeah, you guys are rural too. How about that? Um, we have suburban school districts, and that's uh, Bullitt, Shelby, and Oldham. That makes sense even just from your understanding of the region. Some town districts that fill kind of suburban, suburban as well. Uh, and then we have six rural districts. And depending on what kind of grants you're applying for, um, different federal agencies have different rules about what makes up a rural school or a rural school district. So if you're applying for a grant and you want to know about our region, contact me. Sometimes they use different measures and we have some districts that if you were there, you would say, this is rural, but the federal government in that program doesn't think it's rural. So uh, contact us if you're interested in learning more. There are about 270 schools in our region. Uh, 155,000 students, um, actually it's 154,450 last year. Uh, I think it's gone up this year, well, no, officially in October. Uh, I've given you kind of the racial demographics of the region. Um, there's a lot of diversity in this area. Uh, Jefferson County Public Schools obviously is the most diverse district in our region, uh, but Shelby County has quite a bit of diversity. Some of our independents are quite diverse as well. So um, free reduced lunch percentage is 58% for the region. Um, typically, it trends a little higher than the state average, and we have districts that have a much higher percentage than that as well. And our uh, students that uh, are getting special education services, it's 12% for the region. All right, so a little bit about OVEC. Our vision is leading educational excellence. We support school districts in achieving their goals uh, and supporting their students. Our mission is to support 
lead and inspire through professional learning, advocacy, and services. Uh, and then our foundation, which we have been working hard this year to give it its own identity, um, it has a mission statement as well as we believe that thriving young learners are tomorrow's difference makers. If you believe that, talk to me afterward. All right, so um, OVEC is an education support agency. We have some services where we directly work with students. I'm going to share with you about those services. But we also have a lot of support services where we're working more with district administrators, principals, teachers, and how they help students. So I'll start with direct services. And a little bit later, we'll talk about grant opportunities. We have some flexibility with our direct services uh, and uh, partnering on grant applications. All right, so our major direct service is early childhood education. We are a Head Start and Early Head Start <coughs> grantee. Uh, we currently serve 632 children in this region. Um, we have a 10-county Head Start Early Head Start region that we serve. We uh, have 137 students um, in Jefferson County that are Early Head Start children that we serve. We have applied to expand that, and we're hoping to know soon uh, how much we'll be able to expand our services here in Jefferson County. With Head Start and Early Head Start, we serve children from six weeks of age uh, until uh, they're four years old. So usually in their, when, after they turn four, we help them transition to a district preschool program. Uh, 10 of the 12 of, of the counties we serve, Carroll County and Grant County, Grant County have two different uh, operators for Head Start and Early Head Start. We know them well. If you want to make connections, we can help you with that. In each community that we offer Head Start, Early Head Start, we tailor the program to meet the needs of that community, so it looks different in our different counties. Uh, we offer full day, full year programs in several communities. Um, these are high demand. Parents are very interested in them. It helps uh, families that um, have been struggling a little bit, helps them get back into the workforce or go back and get uh, their education. Uh, we have some school day, school year programs where uh, we're serving kids basically along the school calendar. And then we have a model called Child Care Partnerships, where we actually subsidize quality at child care centers. So we pay them a per student cost, uh, and then they uh, raise their standards and basically run a Head Start program, and we offer support. Uh, we have a whole child approach to our program, so we're not just uh, doing education, although that's obviously a major emphasis for us. Uh, we also are working closely with families to make sure children uh, are achieving health outcomes, if they have dental services, if they need special education services, mental health services. We have a lot that we do for each child in our program. And then we have family services. Um, each family that's enrolled in Head Start and Early Head Start, um, we set goals for them. We work with them for them to set goals, uh, things they want to accomplish as a family, and then we help them find resources to achieve those goals. For a lot of families, that's improving their health, uh, learning to diet, learning to budget, or going back to school, uh, or getting a different job. So we work with them on really practical things. Um, every child that's in Head Start or Early Head Start qualifies either based upon income um, or they have a disability. So we, uh, we focus on serving kids that are in need. Those are our early childhood programs. Um, another direct service we have is iLead Academy. Uh, this is something we started just in the last five years. It is a regional career academy that's in Carrollton, Kentucky, so uh, north of here. Uh, it serves students from rural school districts, and that's Carroll, Gallatin, Henry, Owen, and Trimble counties. These are smaller districts that, um, you know, over the years when we were working with them, when we talked about career ed, we noticed that every one of them had an ag program, but very few of them had an engineering program or a home care program. And so we developed this academy in partnership with these districts to create some opportunities for students. And so the students that go to Ivy are focusing on high demand, uh, well paying careers. So students are learning computer science, engineering, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, industrial trades. Um, and as they're learning some of these skills, they're also earning college credit through JCTC. Um, so we had um, our first graduating class this last summer, and it was 30 students. 26 of those students also graduated with an associate's degree. Uh, so we're really excited about the opportunities that Ivy League Academy is creating. All right, and then we have a newer program for our organization called Pre-Employment Transition Services, Pre-EDS. Uh, this is for teens with special needs, and we're helping them transition to life after school. So um, we have programming throughout the school year and in the summer where we introduce these students to employers, 
uh, and then we help them learn skills that they're going to need for the workforce. So we're helping them develop soft skills, uh, which employers uh, are demanding that we help students grow more in those skills. Uh, and in this last year, we served 300, te 300 teens and help them uh, learn more about work and even get some experiences. These are the best of my pictures, by the way. The rest of the time, we're talking about training and it's teachers sitting around desks. So <laughs> enjoy those. All right, um, so those are our direct services. I'll talk in, in, for a minute, um, a little bit later, about how we can partner with those programs on grants. We also have a, a district support services. Um, and so uh, we try to help districts accomplish their goals. And a lot of that is done through professional learning and some of our role group networks. So uh, we do ongoing technical assistance and training for educators in a lot of different fields. Um, in a variety of roles. Uh, I've listed just some of the more popular groups that we have that are well attended. Uh, it's a, a longer list than this actually. Um, but we do either monthly, quarterly, a couple times a year, we meet with these groups of educators to support them in the work that they're doing. Uh, so the one at the top there, instructional supervisors, this would be uh, folks that are doing uh, curriculum supervision. A lot of times they're assistant superintendents that are in charge of teaching and learning for their whole district. Um, they get together, we offer support and training for them. We have our principals role group, instructional coaches, special, special education directors, just a lot of different professionals we work with. Uh, and this it becomes important in a minute we talk about grants, but this is one of our main services uh, that's uh, quite popular districts appreciate. And then we do lots of professional learning. We do training all throughout the school year in the summer. Each year we offer thousands of hours of training. Last year it was over 8,000 hours of training to educators in this region. Uh, some of the highlights I've listed here, performance-based assessments, uh, cognitive coaching, uh, thinking strategies have been very popular uh, through our cooperative. A lot of districts have learned about metacognition, how they can help students in a unique way there. Adaptive schools, uh, we have tons of uh, content-specific training in math and literacy that we've listed there. Social emotional learning, trauma-informed care, these are uh, different types of training we've offered uh, over the last couple of years. And then a major program at OBEC is Exceptional Children Services, ECS. This is a support group um, that helps educators working with students with special needs. So this is IDEA funded services and is primarily training and technical support to districts and special education administrators and teachers. Uh, so we have a team of experts at OBEC uh, that know uh, quite a bit about special education. We have um, folks that know about behavior, and uh, low incidence um, areas. We have a mathematics consultant, a literacy consultant. We have folks that know IEPs really well. And so they meet with school districts, they meet with administration teachers and help them on these specific skills and strategies in special education. Um, and so yeah, this is a wonderful program. Um, I'm very proud of all the work that they do. They actually are the ones that started our pre-EDS program too. So, uh, and the former director of ECS, Larry Taylor is here. So. Uh, this is a wonderful program that we do. They're in schools um, throughout the year, working directly with teachers uh, in high need situations. All right, so I wanted to inform you a little bit too about our strategic plan, so you can know what things that we're emphasizing. Some of these might be areas that you're looking at as well. And when folks come to us with opportunities that align with our strategic plan, uh, that's a win-win, and we're very eager to partner on grants and other opportunities. Um, so I just pulled a few key objectives from our strategic plan that goes through 2021. Um, there are several things we're trying to do as a cooperative to improve our services. So that's what a few of these bullet points are here. Um, we become very invested in implementation science and how do we in our own programming uh, achieve a high fidelity implementation of the services we offer. So we have a lot of strategies right now of incorporating implementation science across our co-op. We're more and more using design thinking for some of our programming, uh, where you work with end users, interview them, understand their experiences, because we want our service to, services to be responsive to the needs of teachers and administrators throughout the region. Uh, we are very much focused on professional learning, so we have adopted the Learning Board Professional Learning Standards, and in our trainings we are giving uh, learning outcomes based upon those standards, so that our training is the highest quality that we can provide. Uh, we have a group working on micro-credentials for teachers um, as a form of certification. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this in the region for teachers to demonstrate competencies in new ways. 
and for us to tie that to the ways that they're compensated, the ways they're hired, uh, recruited, promoted. So we're doing some work around micro credentials at our cooperative. Um, we always are trying to find ways to support principals um, with the co-op. And a request we've gotten from districts is a program for new principals and new assistant principals so where we can help them and give them some coaching and training as they're new in those roles. Uh, we are uh, pushing uh, several initiatives with our districts that I think a lot of folks are focusing on now. Multi-tier systems of support. We want districts to have that support that students need um, when they have challenges academically or behaviorally. Um, so we're trying to bring those RTI systems to the present uh, to reflect best practice. And then trauma-informed practices are becoming uh, more and more valued throughout the region. And that's uh, an effort that we're um, supporting in our different role groups. And then impacting my work, um, something from our strategic plan is we're seeking a diversity of funding sources. So we are primarily funded by grants, uh, which is great if you're a grant writer, but also uh, a struggle because grants go away, uh, their, their policies change, uh, there are barriers that happen uh, when you're grant funded. So we're always seeking ways to diversify our funding. And I think that's a, just to show you that we're very interested in partnerships. So if there's a grant you're applying for, we are interested in civil wars and helping you achieve the outcomes you're trying to achieve in your grants. All right, so here are some ways that we um, can support grants that you're applying for or programs that you are operating. I want to start with, first with our direct service programs. Again, that's Early Childhood, ILEAD Academy, and then our free appointment transition services. Um, if you have a grant or a program, we can partner with you with these grants and programs. Um, these are open to different um, innovations and different um, types of partnerships and collaborations. Uh, if we commit to a grant involving one of these programs, that we have to make sure that it furthers the objectives of that program. Uh, and I do that by meeting with the leadership from those programs. And we also have to make sure that uh, whatever you propose adheres to their requirements. So particularly with early childhood and Head Start and early Head Start, uh, there are just uh, tons of regulations on what we can do to help children and families that we have to follow very carefully. So if you have an early childhood program or support that you're proposing, we have to make sure that it fits those requirements. Um, there are a few levels of approval required at OBEC for any grant that we partner on. And so obviously I have to kind of approve it to make sure that it fits our priorities. Our CEO has to approve it as well. And then our program leaders have to sign on, off on it. And I've listed them here. If you go to our website, OBEC.org, you can find contact for each of these folks um, that lead these direct service programs. All right, so with exceptional children services, um, from time to time, they make commitments to participate in other grant programs. Um, and then typically that will involve co-leading some training opportunities uh, and providing some classroom coaching that's a follow-up to what you're doing in your grant. Uh, but that grant uh, and that, those services, they have to focus on special education um, on, on those groups of students. And that has to align geographically with the uh, RECS region, which uh, at this point does not include Jefferson County, it's the surrounding counties. Um, so you can reach out to us and we can help you know who we're serving. And I just want you to know, I know that um, matching and in-kind are important on grants, uh, but this is not a source of matching funds for something that you're working on, because it's federal money that comes to us, so we're not allowed to designate that for match. All right, so our district support services, um, we can support your grant with these, with our role network groups and other initiatives we have going on. Um, our primary role through district support is we can recruit districts to participate in your grants. Um, we can give them information, we can do that pre-award, we can facilitate that as before you apply. We can share information with districts in a variety of ways and uh, see if they're willing to commit to participate in your project. We can do that post-award. Um, I'll tell you that is a riskier strategy, uh, but we can commit to do that to share information with districts, but at that point, they may or may not submit to it. So it's always better to do this before you apply. Uh, and I really want to emphasize here our role group network meetings. Uh, we have regular meetings where we have a room full of 50 principals, or where we have all the superintendents from the region, or we have all the assistant superintendents from the region. This is a great way for us to recruit districts and schools to participate in programs. And it's also a way to train these educators. So if you're interested in a training program, we may have the vehicle in place already 
uh, to, for you to meet principles and share strategies with them. All right, and some tips for successful collaboration. A lot of this is going to sound familiar to what Julianne shared. But I just want to encourage you to communicate about grant opportunities as soon as possible. Uh, I know that you're busy and you have a lot of things going on. We're busy as well. If you contact us you know, a few days before a grant is due, the outcome is not going to be great. Um, you might get a letter of support that is very tepid. Uh, but if you can give to us sooner, you know, we could really form a dynamic partnership. I would really uh, suggest, I think Jason Jason Biss would like this as well, that you start coordinating with us before the application is even available. Now, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but if you are into grants, you know you can look at appropriations and you can see what programs may be coming in the year ahead. And it's much better to have a conversation months in advance before a funding opportunity has been announced because we all have more time, we can develop a better program together. Um, our CEO, Dr. Leon Mooneyhan, is the only person authorized to sign letters of support, contracts, MOAs, MOUs. Um, I just want you to know that because there are going to be times where you feel it might be faster to contact another staff member and get them to sign a letter of support. That letter would be meaningless. And grant reviewers should know that that letter is meaningless. So uh, you need to work through me to get to Dr. Mooneyhan and we can get you a letter that is uh, that says something that has significant support and is duly authorized. And I just want to ask you to involve us in the grant development process. Uh, I've been doing this for over 10 years. I've done a lot of federal grants. I've helped universities get major federal grants by collaborating with them, helping them write even some of their applications. And so I just want to put that out there that I can help you in the grant planning process. I can help you in the grant writing process. I can review your grant. That all depends on time, though. We have to have uh, some time to do that. We need to be communicating even before the application becomes available. Um, we need to be planning and working together to, to build this time. And then I really need you, if you are in research, to consider inclusive research designs. I can tell you that when I go to districts with opportunities that are uh, very much oriented to research, one of the first questions is, is there going to be random assignment of students in schools? Uh, they don't want some of their schools getting a resource. Some of their students, some of their teachers getting a resource and other schools and not getting that resource. So if you have to randomize, uh, one way we've gotten around this in the past a little bit is doing a delayed treatment. Where basically some schools will get uh, that service later on toward the end of the grant. And we found that some districts actually like that. They're, they'll say, you know, I would love to do that strategy, but I'm not ready next year. I could be ready in three years or four years or five years. So um, there are just other ways of producing high quality research that doesn't have to be a random control trial experiment. So, um, so those are just some tips for us to work together. Um, I'm going to give you my contact info here, uh, some more ways you can learn about who we are. Um, so you've got my email here, my phone number, you can send this out as well to the group I believe. Um, OVEC has a website, the foundation has a lovely website with a lot of these pictures on it and ways to click and give. Um, and then we're trying to build a more active social media presence as well, especially for our foundation. And we're sharing information regularly about what our programs are doing, innovations that they have, uh, successes that they've experienced. So this is, these are good follows if you're active on social media. So um, that's OVEC and who we are and what I do. Um, happy to entertain questions or to hang around for a few minutes afterwards too. So, this is it. Thank you so yes, much, Jason. Have a gift for you as well. All right. <laughs>
Ben, you want to start? Sure, yeah. Uh, so my name is Ben Fisher, as you mentioned, and um, I don't know that successful is entirely the best word to describe my experience, but I'll talk about some of the successes and non-successes. Uh, before I um, arrived at UofL, um, a, a grant application came across my radar that um, I applied for that I think would have fallen under the category of um, the, the non-publicly available data. So um, you know, one of the things that I did, I didn't have, I didn't know anybody at JCPS, didn't know sort of how their system worked, but relied heavily on somebody who did in my department, Sheree Dawson Edwards, and um, she sort of navigated um, getting, um, getting support from um, Dr. John Marshall um, of uh, initiating the DRMS, did I get that in front? and, uh, and uh, going through that whole system, and that worked out uh, swimmingly. Um, since then, I really wish I would have had some, um, the, the list of things that are the do's and don'ts, the yeses and no's in the green and red columns. Uh, found out recently, uh, again, like folks have mentioned, um, random assignment is going to be tough. So if there was a, a grant that came across um, my radar that required random assignment, and I found out that wasn't going to work out. Um, uh, another thing we were doing was with photography, found out that wasn't going to work out. Um, so um, I think the reason Becky did give my name for this is because uh, one of the things that I really have been doing is I'm building relationships with folks in the district and um, really getting to know sort of where the momentum is around um, the things that the district cares about um, and where that intersects with the work that I do. Um, so figuring out, you know, as, as part of the strategic plan, um, what are their goals, what are creative ways that we can make that intersect with um, the work that I do. Um, to date, that, as I said, has been a bit uh, limited in terms of the number of projects, but um, I've had uh, lots and lots of conversations with folks, and, um, and uh, Becky evidently finds that a valuable thing to have done at this point. So um, hopefully that um, bodes well for future collaborations. Uh, Andy Fry, Kent School Social Work. I've been fortunate to uh, be collaborating with JCPS for um, 15 years plus, and uh, never take that responsibility lately, I hope, and uh, also never take it for granted, and so it's super validating uh, to be asked to say a few words about what I think has gone well. Um, and many things uh, have gone well with that partnership over those years. Um, in, in reflection, I think there's kind of two overarching um, uh, pieces to the strategy, and then I started to think about those through the, the before, the during, and after uh, projects. Uh, so. This is similar to what you've heard all day long, is that it has to be mutually engaging, mutually beneficial work. Um, so if we're asking for something or want something, it's probably clearer to us why it's so uh, uh, grand and meaningful and important to do that work, but it's really the burden is on us to uh, help JCPS see how it would be beneficial for them and for their mission and their goals. Uh, and then the second thing is to secure champions you know, at the educational level. If you're, you know, if you want something supported, you're in a much better place if you have principals, assistant superintendents, a director of a program who are advocating for it on your behalf. It really makes, I think, I suspect it makes the research department's job a whole lot easier uh, if they have somebody uh, that would be directly affected by it saying, yes, I want this to support this project. Uh, so, uh, before you ask, my uh, uh, my thoughts are to offer your time and talent, right? If your first outreach is, I need something, it's probably not where you want to start off. So think about this as a very long-term collaboration, not as a single project. I don't think there's one way to do this, but you know, JCPS, is, you know, they're forming committees, and oftentimes they put out people with outside expertise on those committees. They have professional development um, opportunities. Um, Perhaps they need you know, literature reviews or to assemble information that they don't have you know, the time or the resources, but if you're willing to do it, they would love to use it. So um, just to get in there and find out where you can make a contribution and do that before you're asking if something would be a recommendation for, uh, that I would have. Um, the doing it, right, so that during the project, um, just to do it well, uh, I think the most important thing for me in that respect is, to, is how you hire your staff, right? The people that are going to enter the schools, whether it's for data collection or intervention, those have to be very socially savvy people. They have to be viewed as friendly. They have to understand schools and be able to navigate schools 
Um, if word gets out about your project outside that where you're operating, you definitely want it to be um, you want it to be good. Um, we try to communicate during projects consistently, but not too frequently. We know everybody's busy. We generally do that in the form of uh, annual progress reports. We have one format that's for the research office and for administrators and for principals, and then we have another uh, uh, annual report that we try to do for every project that goes to anybody who's participating in something that we're doing or that's you know, very differently uh, for the audience. Um, and then afterwards to communicate those findings, to bring it to uh, a close, um, and to help them uh, you know, to use that work and build on that to, kind of to further their mission uh, and their goals. And to still be involved in that process if that's helpful to them even after a project completes. Those are my thoughts. Terry Scott, is this on? Um, Terry Scott, I'm in special education. Um, I've been here 12 years, and for the first two or three years, really I didn't do any research in JCPS, but I worked with JCPS schools. What I tried to do is meet principals and teachers and volunteer my time. I spent a lot of time at Burn Creek High School in those first couple of years I was here. I spent a lot of time at was then Myers Middle School. I actually got three or four faculty with me. We went to Myers Middle School at the start of the year and offered to adopt them. And we said, anything you want, we'll come and do. We'll co-teach, we'll consult, we'll, we'll do anything you need. And that turned into, one, a lot of time there, uh, two, a couple of little studies. But the big thing I got out of that was some relationships that ended up being able to foster into bigger things. Um, every time we went to a school, and this is kind of echoing what Andy said, every time we've gone to a school, we've said, what would you like? What would you need? And then we've tried to build our research around what they need. Um, that began with some very small projects, but when we found two or three or four or five schools that were all saying to us they wanted the same thing, we were able to kind of use that as a
um, the, I was interviewing for a literacy faculty position. They gave me an hour with six literacy leaders in JCPS. That sold me on the job, and what happened over those next two years with those six literacy coaches, leaders in the district, is they kept coming to my door, and I kept coming to their door. And so when we talk about recruit and retain, I feel like what, from the very search process, I was given an inroad in to JCPS, and I was able to meet those people that then built that relationship with who I needed to know and what mattered at JCPS. So as Terry, everyone here has talked about the relationship matters, it felt like from the minute, I also knew from that first start that these school partnerships were important to University of Rule, right? From, from the very search process, I knew that. Um, the second story I'm going to tell you is um, I've known Jason for a very long time, and I moved into this early childhood director role the same time Jason was shifting from JCPS to the OVEC role. So we had known each other many, many years and had dreamed up projects and had done grants together. And Jason and I met and we put together our dream list of things we would love to do in, in between UofL and OVEC. And Jason said to me, you know who we need to take this to is the preschool cadre. So we went there, we gave them a handout of grants we thought we could apply to together, and Jason and I were amazed and shocked that all of the things we thought we should be doing grants with, that group of preschool leaders in all of the district gave us a completely different list. It was eye-opening, but yet it also helped us to really reshape what mattered in the districts, what mattered to preschool teachers, and what we need to be spending our time on. And to let you know, one of the things they brought our way was challenging behaviors. And so we started to reshape what grants we would be going for. I showed up at, at um, Terry and Andy's store to say, what are we doing with challenging behaviors for preschoolers, and what can we do to help all that? And so that helped reshape pretty much over the last six months some of the grants we're doing and pre-studies we're doing to be able to help in that way. So it's this wonderfully symbiotic relationship where you move forward with here's what's happening in the profession and what we think we could do, what we think we could get grants for, and then realizing what are the needs of the very teachers and the children in the districts. So um, my two stories, but again, I will tell you those relationships are critical. Um, both inside research and beginning to develop those so that teachers, administrators are all partners with us rather than the researched, they're part of our research. Thank you all. I think what I took away from that was the importance of developing relationships very early in your grant research process. Um, well before you even develop your research question, maybe you go and find out what the research interests of the districts are and what their needs are. Um, and uh, so thank you very much for that. We're going to open it up to questions and answers now. If we can have Jason and Julianne join our panel. And, and Jason, there's another chair I think you can bring to the front. So if anyone has um, a question that you'd like to ask, just please try and speak. Um, loudly so everyone can hear. Thank you. Um, health behaviors, particularly in early childhood and preschool, which is really becoming a priority. And what I hear now is a lot about educational research. Is there an interest in a need in OVAC and the Jefferson County Public Schools related to health behaviors in children? I'm a nursing researcher, so. Um, so did everyone hear her question? Raise your hand if you did not hear it. Okay, go ahead. Did you say health behaviors? Health behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's a, uh, that would be a critical week for us with okay. Head Start and Early Head Start, uh, especially as kids transition to Head Start in preschool, like you're trying to teach them some health self-advocacy uh, as part of their uh, curriculum that we're engaged in. We used to create a curriculum, okay. uh, so it's something we're assessing for that they understand some basic uh, health preservation type skills. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, to answer a question from the JCPS side, you should contact Eva Stone, as she's the district health coordinator, about any interest that she may have as well. Eva? Eva, E-V-A, Stone. Okay. She's the district health coordinator. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, 
questions? So uh, I just have a question. You guys are talking a lot about building relationships, and that sounds important. And how would we go about starting that process? I, and you had mentioned about how you can have various opportunities. Where are these various opportunities? Can I just toss my business card out and say, hey, if you guys need anything? <laughs> I mean, I can say how I did it. I don't think there's one path. Um, if you don't know the, um, uh, and I would like to hear what the research group, the JCBS and the other people had to say as well. I mean, I knew I was involved in some early childhood stuff, and I was doing services for them, so I largely got in by just you know doing everything that I could in that particular group that seemed to be... Uh, uh, that, it, that did embrace me, right? I was trying to go a lot of places where I wasn't necessarily embraced, so I went where the opening was and spent time there and, um, uh, and developed relationships there, and then those uh, expanded. But so, I mean, I think you might want to talk to, um, it really depends on your area of interest. There, you know, the, super, the assistant superintendent level is a possible area of entry. They might be able to um, uh, uh, point you in the right direction. If you could, I mean, put together something brief. I have had times when the landscape of JCPS has changed, and I hadn't been there in a while, so I wasn't exactly sure where to go. And I would always start with my research liaison and say, "Okay, I've got this on the radar. You know, help me. Where, where, what's, what's shifted? Where do I need to, you know, um, uh, turn to? I don't know. Kind of professional development, committee work. But if they don't know you're out there." Right, They're, it's going to be hard to get utilized. So you have to find out how to get your, how to communicate to people who would care and be able to use you what it is that you can contribute. I'll add that our office is always happy to help you make those connections. If you can contact us and give us a brief explanation of what you're interested in and who it might impact, we can help you make those connections as well. Great, thank you. And I can do something similar on the other region. But some specific other opportunities, um, every month before our board meeting, um, we have a P through 16 council that has some U of L faculty that come, and they usually have a guest speaker they bring in from different uh, expert, you know, expert levels and, and, and constant areas. So um, that, that might be an opportunity to kind of present to even like superintendents that are there. Uh, and then our role groups, occasionally we have guest speakers come from universities or other service providers that can add some value to the role group, but also you're developing a relationship with the principal or counselors. Thank you. And those of you who collaborate with College of Education and Human Development or uh, those of you who are with College of Education and Human Development, that is my role. Um, I've been hired to help you build those collaborative relationships. Um, and the other thing that I will kind of advise is you, you have four people here that have been recognize as people who do it right, collaborate with them, can I say that? <laughs> At least talk with them, you know, and say, hey, do you know anybody who has a similar interest? Everybody here is here because they have an interest in JCBS and OVAC, I assume. And if that's the case, you have people out here that you can potentially collaborate with that have varying levels of success or experience, and so that might be a way for you to find your way in as well. Any other questions? I have a question mostly for JCPS, and I should um, should qualify this by saying that I'm a first semester doc student, so I'm relatively new to this process. Um, but I was wondering, if in order to determine and maintain social validity of the 100 plus projects that you review uh, as part of the IRB process, do you have any community members or anyone outside of JCPS or even educators in the building that are part of the process of determining what projects you pursue as a district? As far as projects we pursue, um, going inside out, we rely heavily on district leadership to make those decisions based on their priorities. From the review end, um, an IRB is always required to have at least one non-scientist, and so we have several people on the committee, including school people, so that um, that's really important. We've added some school people this year, and we're going to continue to add a few more because we need them to see from their lens what will be valuable, what would be an obstacle to them or to the research to, in order to get it implemented. So um, going from what do we prefer, that's kind of driven mostly by the leadership. Um, if, if there are projects coming in, I mean, when we do our own evaluations internally, 
we also participate in those, that decision making process. But if you're talking about external people coming in, then uh, we rely on them to help develop those relationships in, in those critical areas. And then from the review end, we've got people who um, use their lens to make sure that we're choosing things that are appropriate for our, the district and the community. Other questions? Okay, so um, I want to thank you all for coming in and uh, the College of Education and Human Development, oh, here's our office name, Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnership, <laughs> our new name, uh, is here to build partnerships, advance research, and support productive innovation. Uh, we are grateful for the time and effort of our colleagues at JCPS and OVEC and the U of L faculty, so please help me give a uh, round of applause. We have lots of opportunities to expand our relationships and research, and we hope that you will join the College of Education and Human Development Office of Innovation and, um, and Strategic Partnership and other workshops and events that we have. One way you can help us to have more is by completing the evaluation form and just dropping it off right by the, the food uh, table uh, before you leave. Yes, yeah, so there is a number. Um, so everyone here, like I said before, has something in common that's an interest in collaboration, collaborating with JCPS and OVEC. So if you have time, spend some time, get a staff over here, and find new partners. So thank you so much. Um,